they are highly socially vulnerable than other communities. Tonight, seniors, visible minorities, and indigenous people are at a higher risk from flooding caused by climate change. There's logging roads they put in, was all put in without our consent, so we're going to deactivate them. A First Nation in British Columbia vows to keep moose hunters out of their territory. Just really would appreciate being able to, to learn at home. And hubs of higher learning. The university students in some Manitoba First Nations can work on their degree from home. Good evening. Welcome to APTN National News. I'm Melissa Ridgen. A 15-year-old Winnipeg boy has been charged in a Canada-wide warrant has been issued for another teen in connection with a series of violent incidents that happened on Monday, one of them involving the death of an Indigenous woman. Tamara Pimentel has, has, has this story. Police were called to several incidents early Monday morning in Winnipeg's North End, including a report of a deceased woman in an apartment building. She was later identified as 36-year-old Danielle Dawn Ballantyne. Prior to the discovery of Ballantyne's body, police responded to two assaults in the same area that sent two men to hospital in critical condition. It was announced on Friday that 54-year-old Marvin Felix died of his injuries. A 15-year-old male is in custody and has been charged with two counts of second-degree murder and aggravated assault. In a press conference, Constable Danny McKinnon announced a Canada-wide warrant for another 15-year-old facing the same charges. He is being identified as Gavin Elvis Bone. The situation has um, really left the community shaken, um, the police as well. Winnipeg has seen over 30 homicides so far in 2022. MP Leah Gazan represents Winnipeg Centre. She says when it comes to missing and murdered Indigenous people, calls to justice aren't being heard. We've had a national inquiry that put out 231 calls, um, calls for justice. Uh, you know, and the government has been slow to act, and this is costing lives. She says there is a clear way forward to address the increase of crime in Winnipeg. We need mental health uh, foot patrols. We need to invest in housing. You know, we have a poverty crisis in the city of Winnipeg. We need to listen to public health experts and people that are working on the front lines and frontline organizations in our community. McKinnon says it's believed all the attacks were random, and all incidents are being investigated by the Homicide Unit. Tamara Pimentel, APTN National News, Winnipeg. Once again, that Canada-wide warrant is for a 15-year-old Gavin Elvis Bone. He's approximately 5 foot 6 inches in height, weighing about 150 pounds. He has a scar on his left cheek. Anyone who sees Bone is advised to call police. We're going to try to get that picture up on our social media so you can see him there. Uh, we want to hear what you think about this or any of the stories that we bring you or that we should be bringing you. Here's how you can get in touch with us. Send your emails to news at aptn.ca. Leave a comment on aptnnews.ca. You can also find us on Facebook, Instagram, YouTube, Twitter, and TikTok. Follow APTN News to join the conversation and see all of our latest stories. Well, it's now official. Prime Minister Justin Trudeau has appointed Michelle Obansowin to the Supreme Court of Canada. Did that this morning. Obanso and seen here fielding questions on Wednesday by a joint committee of MPs and senators becomes the first Indigenous person to occupy a seat in Canada's highest court. She is an Abenaki member of the Odenak First Nation in Quebec, but she grew up in a Franco-Ontario town near Sudbury. Obansoin officially takes up her new appointment on September 1st. Well, one NDP politician is speaking about, out about the growing trend of harassment of those in the media, where journalists who are Indigenous, Black, and from other racialized minority groups are often the target. APTN's Fraser Needham has more. Global News journalist Rachel Gilmore sent out this tweet earlier this week. Last night, someone who clearly owns guns directly threatened and harassed my entire family. I'm speaking to police chief about this, but it's already forcing my loved ones to take precautions. You can disagree with my reporting, you can critique it, but don't threaten my family. An NDP MP Leah Gazan says she has also noticed an increasing and disturbing trend. One of the pillars of a functioning democracy is to uh, ensure freedom of the press. 
Uh, and that means uh, allowing journalists to do what they need to do um, uh, to, as part of a functioning democracy. You know, the recent harassment of women, particularly uh, female journalists, a Black, Indigenous and people of colour has been abhorrent. In a recent letter to the police chiefs of Ottawa and Toronto and posted online, the Canadian Association of Journalists makes a number of observations. For the most part, these reports have been filed by racialized journalists or writers who are experiencing an increasing number of targeted, vile threats of violence. The volume and nature of the rhetoric has caused many of these journalists to fear for their safety. Many of the threatening emails use similar language, the same language commonly used by domestic extremist groups. And we ask that you review and improve our, your respective processes for making complaints of hate speech and harassment. It should go without saying that victims should not be made to wait hours on the phone to file complaints. Gazan says she agrees the attacks against journalists are largely coming from those affiliated with the extreme far right. We have a, a growing uh, alt-right move, movement. Uh, we've had leaders, I would say Trump, that have uh, you know made people feel emboldened uh, to come out and and with the most as we are seeing with the journalists with the most violent uh, aggressive attacks. Journalists complained of being harassed this past winter by members of the Freedom Convoy who occupied downtown Ottawa streets for more than a month. And more recently, there have been complaints against another convoy affiliated group, the United People of Canada, who are currently fighting eviction from a former church in Ottawa. And Gazan says it's not only police that need to step up to address the problem but also the federal government. The Prime Minister needs to meet with the Canadian Association of Journalists. He needs to heed uh, their calls for safety and uh, not tweet, but he needs to act immediately. Mr. Needham, KP10 National News, Ottawa. A group of high-profile Indigenous women in Saskatchewan issued a rallying cry in support of Don Walker today. The Saskatoon mother from Okanese Cree Nation and the Federation of Sovereign Indigenous Nations Executive. She remains in police custody on charges relating to her and her son's disappearance last month. Impotence Leanne Sanders has the story. Emotions ran high at a news conference calling for support for Dawn Walker. She's back in Canada to face charges of child abduction and public mischief, while U.S. officials allege she used false documents to enter the country. Kathy Walker says she's grateful her older sister Dawn was released from the Oregon jail where she'd been held since her arrest. But the family still hasn't spoken with her since she was brought to Surrey, B.C., where she remains in custody. My heart also goes out to the other families who have sisters and aunts and mothers and daughters who should be getting, who should be getting the help they deserve as well rather than being punished for doing their best to survive, you know, the violence and trauma that is really targeted towards, you know, our Indigenous women, girls and two-spirit people. Treaty Commissioner Ann Walker's friend, Mary Culbertson, shared her personal story of domestic violence, which the women at today's news conference allege was at the heart of Walker's disappearance. People will say, I can't imagine you with a black eye and I said imagine being eight months pregnant with broken fingers and a black eye and three kids in a car and running away in the middle of the night and phoning from a gas station because I had nowhere to go I wanted to die and I just kept driving back to my first nation and the reality is when women are not listened to, when survivors of domestic violence are not listened to, you sometimes don't feel you have any choice. Culbertson said men criticizing Walker have no room to talk and that the justice system failed to help Walker because it was built for men. Federation of Sovereign Indigenous Nations is calling for an investigation into the police and RCMP's handling of Walker's domestic abuse complaints. No charges have ever been laid against Walker's ex-partner. We stand by Dawn and all women that endure abuse in all its forms. We believe you, I believe you. Today is the day to call for sweeping changes to how our systems 
handle domestic abuse reports and fail to have mechanisms to protect and serve our most vulnerable. None of the speakers would elaborate on Walker's claims of abuse, saying it was her story to tell. It remains to be seen when she'll return to Saskatoon or when she will be released from custody. Leanne Sanders, APTN National News, Saskatoon. We have some breaking news for you from Alberta now, where one of the Bilodeau brothers, Roger, has received a 10-year sentence minus time served in the killings of two Métis hunters. Our Chris Stewart is in court. He is uh, going to bring you the rest of the details on this story on Monday. We have to take a break, but still ahead, a new study shows that vulnerable groups are at a higher risk of being seriously impacted by flooding. We'll have those details when we come back. A new study has found that socially vulnerable groups, including Indigenous people, are at a greater risk of flooding caused by climate change. The study of the, by the University of Waterloo uses flood hazards and census population. They were able to determine socially vulnerable groups like seniors, visible minorities, and Indigenous people are more drastically impacted when flooding occurs. This is expected to get worse, of course, with climate change. Uh, it also found that a greater proportion of indigenous populations are at risk of river flooding. They are highly socially vulnerable than other communities. And the obvious question is why? Because of the lack of the resources, lack of access to the information. A BC First Nation is asking those with moose tags issued on their traditional territory to stay home. The Chilcotin Nation says that the moose population is at the lowest level on record and they're concerned that their members will not be able to feed their families. British Columbia doubled the limited entry, of, uh, entry hunt of moose in Chilcotin territory this year. In a press release, the nation says that they were against the increase, they weren't properly consulted. Chief Joe Alphonse says that he's shocked by the province's lack of respect for their idol, uh, Aboriginal title. They're now uh, going to limit access on specific roads into their territory. You know, maybe there needs to be a new wake-up call, a new court case started. Then. What we're doing here, as far as I'm concerned, is not illegal. This is, this is without our consent. Those logging roads they put in, was all put in without our consent, so we're going to deactivate them. It was revealed this week that the Treasury Board of Canada will not offer a bilingual bonus for employees who speak an Indigenous language. Lori Idlut is the MP for Nunavut, and 65% of Nunavut speak Inuktitut as their first language. She's been lobbying to have the $800 a year bonus made available for civil servants who speak an Indigenous language. She spoke with Dennis Ward earlier. Lori, thanks for joining us today. Uh, to begin with, uh, around 75% of Inuit and in Nunavut can carry on a conversation in Inuktitut, but getting service in Inuktitut is a challenge. Uh, how does that play out on the ground? Uh, it means that those uh, people that mainly speak Inuktitut or read Inuktitut are not getting the quality service uh, that they deserve. And when they do get it from um, in, from Inuit federal employees, those federal uh, Inuit employees are being discriminated against by the federal system for not being bilingual in French. Yeah, the Public Service Alliance of Canada is saying that not giving this bonus is effectively discrimination. Uh, obviously, that's something you, you would agree with? Yes, absolutely. Uh, I, I think that uh, Indigenous uh, federal employees uh, deserve to uh, be recognized for the skills they have for being able to speak in, in, in their Indigenous languages. Uh, they deserve to get the same benefits uh, as federal employees that are bilingual in French or English. Uh, so I'm, I'm hoping that the Treasury Board does change its mind about uh, excluding uh, Indigenous language federal employees' benefits. Your party, the NDP, are the ones uh, lending your support to help keep this minority government alive. Or do decisions like this, uh, not offering a bonus to Indigenous language speakers, does that affect any of that? 
Um, the confidence agreement that we have with the Liberal government uh, is very important. Uh, I think that it helps to make sure that we don't have another election too imminently. Uh, it helps to give stability uh, within Canada. So I, I think that it also we can also leverage it for priorities that are important to us. And we have done that, for example, with making sure that there are uh, expansions on uh, making sure that dental care is provided to more Canadians, uh, as well as pharma care that will come later. So uh, I, I think that uh, we do definitely as with through this self con this uh, confidence agreement. Uh, I'm hoping to use it to make sure that the Treasury Board uh, changes its mind about providing benefits to its Indigenous federal employees. We understand there's a, a pretty familiar office dynamic in Nunavut where the, the one Inuit employee ends up being an informal translator for the entire office without being compensated. I'm sure you found yourself in that situation uh, being relied on to interpret because there's no one else to. Can you explain how much pressure that puts on that inv individual employee? Uh, it, it's a lot of pressure, especially if they haven't been trained to be an interpreter. Uh, interpreters provide valuable services and they, uh, as trained uh, professionals, uh, they really help to make sure that the communication uh, is shared between the two languages that don't understand each other. So, in, so for Inuit that haven't uh, trained to be interpreters, they might, uh, lose uh, some of the context in translation. So I think that being able to provide them this benefit will help make sure that they are being recognized for the important work that they do as bilingual in Inuktitut or in other indigenous languages. MP Idlut, uh, just quickly here uh, for yourself, you know, you've been speaking some Inuktitut in the House of Commons. Is that something that's easy to pull off with uh, interpreters or is that a challenge as well? It's a challenge as well. Uh, I have to give uh, notice, two days notice, if I'm going to uh, speak, if I want to speak Inuktitut uh, in the House of Commons. Uh, and a lot of the times we're not able to provide it because uh, when we're uh, asking questions, uh, it's not scheduled ahead of time. Uh, sometimes I'm asked on last minute to ask a question, so it's not always possible. It is a challenge. But uh, the Parliamentary uh, Translation Bureau has been great. They've been very supportive. Uh, they are doing what they can to make improvements. And I'm hoping that with, with my uh, uh, priority as an Inuktitut language speaker, that I'm leading the way for other indigenous languages to also be interpreted from their languages to English or French. Uh, I, we do experience delays. Uh, for example, yesterday uh, during um, the important uh, historic event with the, uh, the nomination of Justice Michelle Obansawin, uh, I had tried to speak in Inuktitut, which would have been translated into English, then into French. Uh, the delays uh, in, in that process made it challenging for uh, the French uh, MPs to uh, understand uh, uh, or feel like they were understanding what was going on. So there are challenges, but I think uh, we're, we're paving the way for improvements. Absolutely. Uh, MP, we'll have to leave it there, but sure appreciate you sharing some of your experience with us. Thank you so much, and I hope you have a good day. Time for another break, but still ahead, a new university hub in a remote part of Manitoba. Stay with us. Welcome back. It's time now for our photo of the day. 
Victoria St. Jean of the Cat Ladici or Cat Ladesh First Nation. I'm not sure how to say that. She took this picture on the southern shores of the Great Slave Lake. She sent us this beautiful shot. It's the sunset uh, over Hay River. We know that you're taking great shots out there too. We would love to see them. Email share at aptn.ca so we can make you our next photo of the day. Let's take a look now at tomorrow's weather forecast. To the east coast, we got sunshine and 24 in St. John's, Halifax, showers and 23 degrees. Kujuak 13 and rain in Nooktuak looking like cloud, 9 degrees there. Gas Bay 21 in showers, same with Montreal. Ottawa showers and 23 degrees expected. Sault Ste. Marie sunshine, 27. 27 for Capus Casing and Timmins with a little bit of cloud there. Same with you in Wawa. Pukatawagan, 29 and sunny skies, 28 for the Paw and Norway House. The sun continues for some of southern Manitoba. Barrens River, 28. Winnipeg, 27. Swift current showers and 27 degrees. Saskatoon, 28. Rain expected there too. Cloudy for you in Buffalo Narrows and 23 degrees, 24 in sunshine for Stony Rapids. 31 in cloud for Peace River, Fort Chip, 24 in cloudy there. 25 in sunshine for Lethbridge, 26 with a chance of showers for Medicine Hat. Kamloops, 26 and rain there, 22 in Campbell River and sunny skies. Smithers, 18 and sunny. Deese Lake showers, 13 degrees. Beaver Creek, 16 and uh, mix of sun and clouds, same with you in Old Crow. Wati Sunshine and 19, Fort Leard and Trout Lake, both 21 inch cloud, Colville Lake Sunshine and 18, Politech showers, 10 degrees expected there, 10 degrees for you as well in New York, but uh, you might see a little bit of sunshine, 7 and sunny for Arctic Bay, Pangerton cloud and 11 degrees. A new way to attend university while staying home is underway in Manitoba. A learning hub has opened in Penamatang First Nation. The hubs will allow students enrolled in post-secondary institutions to access computers, books and an internet access in a trailer that's specifically set up for that. There's also a coordinator to assist students. Dr. Catherine Cook is Métis and she's the Indigenous Vice President at the University of Manitoba. We reached her uh, on the way back from the programs launched in, in Penamatang. She told APTN News about how the students are uh, reacting to this new hub. They talked about how lonely and how stressful it had been. And the students that are now attending school in Winnipeg uh, talked about how while they're enjoying their learning opportunity, just really would appreciate being able to, to learn at home. The Learning Hub is being coordinated through the Interlake Reserves Tribal Council, which represents six First Nations in Manitoba in that Interlake area. And $16.1 million is being committed to, by, to the University of Manitoba through the MasterCard Foundation to help build learning hubs in First Nations communities. We are all out of time for your Friday news. We're so glad that you could join us. As I mentioned earlier, Roger Bilodeau, the father who, in the father-son duo that's convicted of killing two Métis hunters in Alberta, he was just now sentenced to 10 years for the crime. We'll bring you all of those details on Monday. I'm Melissa Ridgen. Have a great night and a safe weekend. Get out and enjoy those dying days of summer. I'll see you back here tomorrow.